I have not actually, I have actually not seen this video. In my last video, I introduced the two major bottlenecks that slow your program down. Okay. Compute bound and memory bound. Yep. At the end of the video, I mentioned the specific compute bounded task, which is general matrix matrix multiplication. I remember this video. I think we this watched operation, this video. Despite its apparent simplicity, can be remarkably challenging to optimize like efficiently. It. In today's episode, we're going to walk through some genius algorithms to make it over 100 times faster. All achieved through pure CPU optimization techniques, leveraging CMD and cache strategies. Okay. Some of these techniques might seem counterintuitive at first glance, but they'll start to make perfect sense as we delve deeper into the underlying reasons. We'll begin by implementing a vanilla jam algorithm. Okay. A straightforward approach involves a triple for loop structure to compute the dot product for each entry in the matrices. This is code that I let copilot right now. Uh, what was it? It must have been like, gosh, two years ago, I wrote matrix multiplication on stream. It just, you know, writing this thing just takes so much. It's just the world's worst thing to write. Here, we simplify the input to be square matrices of size mat size. Yep. The performance of this basic implementation is notably slow. Yep. Taking approximately two seconds to process matrices of size 1k by 1k. Of course, we're not even using yeah, multi threading right now. I mean, so I don't let's know about do it with the open MP parallel four time. macro. It seems that right because it's n cubed, right? And so n being a square matrix that be a thousand times a thousand times a thousand. Oh, that's a billion. That's a billion. I'm pretty good at math. Okay, I'm really good at the maths. Okay, uh, just use an npm package to do that. Simd's nuts matrix multiplication npm package. Just install it in. Quick maths. We've already accelerated the algorithm by a factor of ten. Oh, this is because my CPU boasts an eight core sixteen thread configuration. However, despite this improvement, the important question right now is, is it really fast enough? Yeah. We are going to optimize an algorithm. When should we be satisfied? To understand this question, we have to do the math first. Okay, not a big According fan of math. According to Intel specifications, my CPU has a maximum compute bandwidth of 600 gigaflops. That's the memory bandwidth limitation stands. That's a lot of flops. I'm not gonna lie to you. I, I, don't, I don't think I have that many flops. Does, does an average man have this kind of many flops? Or is this like an unusual amount of G flops? It's at approximately 46 gigabytes per second. Mm. However, keep in mind that memory bandwidth isn't solely dictated by your CPU. Peripheral factors, including lower memory frequencies and underutilized memory channels, can also decrease your practical memory bandwidth. To test the memory bandwidth in the production environment, return to the stream benchmark. I'm never gonna, I, I'm not gonna lie to you guys, I've never been to this level of optimization. You know what I mean? I've never had to optimize here. Like I've never hit a memory bus problem, right? Skill issue, hard skill issue. Okay, my 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 flops are way too floppy for this. You never used NPM? Fair. Okay, maybe maybe I have. Maybe maybe I have ran into it. Maybe I've only been subjected to the memory problem, but I've never actually done the memory problem. According to this benchmark's result, my system's practical memory bandwidth ceiling hovers around twenty-one gigabytes per second. Okay. Equivalent to 5.25 gigaflops. It's a lot. The next question is, we all know that Jam... Relating memory to gigaflops, is that normal? That seems confusing, because it's a floating point operation. But what does that mean in... Is that just saying that it can only... You can only send through the results of so many flops? It's not really a comparison? Yeah, I was, I, am, I can, am I the only one? Bandwidth limits G floppies. <laughs> I can't believe I just read that phrase out loud, but I guess we're going to be calling them G floppies from here on out. Uh, yes, the G does stand for Giga Chat flops. Will eventually become compute bonded from the last video. Okay. But when? The answer, theoretically, isn't overly complex. Since we can find out the total number of memory access to be 3 n squared and the total number of floating point operations required is 2 n cubed, Jam should shift from being memory bound to compute bound when n exceeds 380. But here's the problem. At a resolution of 1K by 1K, both the compute bandwidth and memory bandwidth fail to reach their full potential. This is because we have a relatively low cache hit rate within our naive implementation. Mm -hmm. Note that each entry in the matrices A and B needs to be accessed multiple times. But if they don't reside in the cache, our memory access count can get close to 3 n cubed rather than the expected 3 n squared. This complication can be problematic when n is large, as the cache is less likely to keep the data when the same entry is accessed the next time. However, okay. if you have a relatively small matrix, there's even a pretty high chance the entire matrix can be accommodated within a large cache. So, increasing the cache hit rate, huh? Where should we start? Introducing the first trick. 
transposing one of the matrices from row major to column major. Okay, I've heard about this. This is that just? I assume you don't act. Do you do you transpose the matrix or do you just walk it differently? Because is actually copying over the matrix to a new piece of memory really the way you do this, or is it actually just just walking? You're saying yes, transpose. Yes, so you actually. You you do it you do the transposition on the fly or do you actually copy it? Yes to the copy. Okay. This small adjustment makes our algorithm run three times faster. But you might be wondering, are we doing more computation when transposing the matrix? Well, this brings us to the two principles of cache optimization: maximizing spatial locality and temporal locality. In our original Jam implementation, both of these aspects are suboptimal. Yeah. You see, in the vanilla Jam. Both matrices A and B are stored in row major order. However, when performing the matrix multiplication, matrix B is accessed along its columns. This means that the algorithm needs to skip an entire row to access the next value. Yeah. But wait a second, it's not like truly random memory access, so a modern cache system can handle this pattern, right? And you'd be correct. Actually, your CPU likely employs prefetching as long as you have a stable memory access pattern like this. The problem is that you don't cache a single float when you access the value. But cache an entire cache lot. The way you access matrix B results in a substantial amount of cache being brought in but not fully utilized. Therefore, the low spatial locality in this case leads to inefficient cache lot utilization. Transposing the matrix B, despite the more computation and even memory access overhead it incurs, significantly improves the cache lot utilization and mm, therefore increases the overall performance at the end of the day. So we can improve the spatial locality by transposing the matrix. What about temporal locality? To so that's a great that's a great visualization for showing you because you just always want to walk it linearly, right? Like that's why they that's why I mean one of the most common ways to increase performance in the most simplest way is that if you have a set of like ten items, fifteen items, you don't use a set even if you're removing and adding. Instead, you just put them into an array, and yeah, when you remove, you have to move everything back. But it just makes it so that you get this nice, tight array where everything's located that you can walk really, you know, swiftly. And even that adjusting is still better. Plus, you have whatever the complication is of the hashing factor, right? So there's a, I mean, these type of improvements are are wild, right? They're just not something that I think the average programmer thinks about. But they do exist, and there are really good practical implications for them, which is really nice. Power locality. We must first understand what caused it to be suboptimal. In the context of our matrix multiplication, every entry in matrices A and B needs to be accessed multiple times.、Mm -hmm. However, when dealing with large matrices, holding an entire row in the cache can be challenging. So, how can we make this memory access more efficient? Here comes the magic of linear algebra. Each entry in the result matrix C I J equals to the sum of A I K times B K J for k from zero to n. Classic. But if we divide the matrix, in I have never heard someone say that in such a swift way. I mean, he just tossed out that quick math, so quick and mathy. Like that was just like the most natural. It was that was it was beautiful. It was beautiful. Oh, our blocks. The entries still equal to the sum of multiplication within each block. And when you really think about it, you will find we are actually doing matrix multiplication in blocks. Each block multiplication is essentially another smaller matrix multiplication. Why is this useful? Well. Imagine if we choose a block size that's small enough to fit entirely inside a cache. Ideally, by doing so, we'd only need to access each entry in the matrix l times instead of n times. Take a look at this code snippet. While it may appear to have more nested loops, the total number of floating point operations remained unchanged. What we've achieved is a significant improve in the memory access pattern, resulting in a better temporal locality. By breaking down the matrix multiplication into smaller and cache-friendly blocks. We can maximize the reuse of data stored in the cache, thereby accelerating our jam algorithm. That's enough for the concept. Let's turn our attention to the practical side, performance. Sadly, using blocked jam can be a little bit more challenging than the transposed jam, since you need to decide what block size to use. You also have five for loops. <laughs> It's not just that you have to decide the. You got the whole five for loops. Really easy to screw up there. Remember, the actual number of memory accesses is the product of total size of two matrices Q and squared, and the number of memory access for each entry L. Choosing a small block size will result in a large block number L. 
Therefore, the total number of memory access to n squared L can approach the worst case memory access time to n cubed. Okay. On the other hand, selecting a block size that's too large to fit inside a cache may negate the advantage of using blocks altogether. In practice, different machines may prefer different block sizes. Okay. And the only way to find the best block size is through experimentation. Another important difference between the blocked gem and transposed gem is, well, we don't need to transpose anymore. Our goal is to fit the entire block inside a cache. Moreover, people often tend to choose block sizes that are integer multiple of cache line length. So transposing the matrix won't improve the performance, right? Let's transpose Always it to nester. see what happened anyway. I have never had to optimize something to this level. When I look at this, this just looks like, I mean, none of it is crazy surprising, right? Like we all know that you want to exist in, in, in as small, you know, you want to exist in the most memory efficient way, but to actually like, I've never had anything at my job where this is something I've had to do, right? I've never had a locality problem. And so it's, it's very interesting. I mean, this, this seems like, this is like a game engine work in my head. This is what I assume. This is like, this is ECS stuff. This is where like the real optimization happens. The things that you don't actually really think about a lot. Uh, it reminds me also of like, it probably, this is probably in some this type of optimization, this like making things closer is also like the SME optimization in V8 where they do, they do small integers. So if you have an array of integers that are small, you literally have an array of integers in, uh, in V8, which is just going to allow for pretty fast access. Whereas, you know, in the oldie days, it would have to go to each integer and then hop to each uh, heap offset where they stored it in the heap to be cleaned up. Now it doesn't have to do that. You know, so there's like a little bit of a little something there. Yeah, I assume it's also with any of the uh, any of the amazings um, uh, ML stuff. ML is just one gigantic linear equation continuously running. MLPs are just they're literally just doing sweet, sweet MLP stuff. Or the sweet, performance sweet increased again. That's a little bit unexpected. Okay. As I mentioned good. earlier, transposing matrix B doesn't fundamentally change the cache line utilization. Instead. He improved the performance by affecting another parallel mechanism, SIMD. These nuts. You might have noticed that I added an OpenMP SIMD macro just before the innermost loop. This seemingly small addition enables the compiler to leverage SIMD instructions for dot product calculations within the blocks. Oh. Now, if you've been following my previous videos, you are probably familiar with SIMD's capabilities. It can perform multiple floating point operations in a single CPU cycle. But there's a catch. It depends on efficiently loading data into SIMD registers. Yeah. For the block jam without you want transposition, them to be adjacent, the innermost right? loop direction only aligns with matrix A. Yeah. After transposing matrix B, we can load both matrices into SIMD registers easily. Now, let's explore another counterintuitive but highly effective optimization technique, popping blocks into local buffers. In the code you see, we've made a significant change by hard coding the block size into the algorithm. This provides the compiler with more information for compile time optimization. Okay. However, the real magic lies in our ability to create local copies of data for each block. Copying data is often considered an expensive operation, but in this case, it almost doubles the performance again. The reason behind this approach is once again related to cache optimization. Notice I used the align as keyword when allocating the local buffer. This ensures that all local buffers start at addresses that are multiple of 64 which is the length of the cache line on my machine. Yeah. Remember that every time you access an address, the entire cache line containing that address get loaded into the cache. By making sure that our data structures align with cache lines, we again increase the cache line utilization. Mm -hmm. The next reason we are using local buffers here use, use size inside people. this OpenMP thread private Mac. I believe that's why Rust has in their Mac uh, or in their structs. Like if you do two 8-bit uh, uh, members in a Rust struct, it's still eight bytes or it's, it's system length bytes right uh times two and so it won't be or not eight bytes it'll be 16 bytes even though you only are using two bytes technically it's because it's always doing these these uh larger offsets because it's just fast to read it's fast to put those things there you might recall a discussion about for sharing the last video when two threads try to access the data on the same cache line performance can plummet even without locks or other software limitations the hardware often interferes to synchronize cache line between different physical cores, causing performance degradation. To solve this issue, you need to guarantee that not only does each thread have its own private data, but also mm. these data blocks reside on different cache lines. I know it sounds a little bit stupid when I said, just keep them on different cache lines. 
but the solution is really that simple. Just use the OpenMP thread private macro. It copies a private buffer for each thread response and also handles the force sharing concern perfectly. Looks good, but there's actually one more problem we can solve. Matrix transposition. As discussed previously, the performance gain from transposing matrix B is mainly attributed to achieving alignment with the innermost seam D loop in both local A and local B. However, what if we could achieve this alignment without matrix transposition? Yeah. It turns out we can. Okay. If the matrix B is not transposed, the code will look like this. But hold on a second. There are still two local buffers aligned the same way, local B and local C. Actually, instead of transposing the matrix to let the buffer align with the loop, we can swap the loop to let them align with the buffer. This adjustment doesn't affect the computational logic of our algorithm. It merely transform the access pattern of the buffer. Uh, and that is that what I isn't that what I said earlier? We could instead of copying, we can just literally walk it in the correct order. Pre-watched. I pre I pre-watched this one. Clearly pre-watched this one. I knew it. I knew it. I knew the pre-watching was gonna happen. It just felt right. Oh man. I mean that makes perfect sense. Like if your goal is to access in a nice linear way, why copy all why transpose when you could just access that way? Who's the VTuber now? This guy is. Now we can get rid of the annoying matrix transposition step. There are also some minor details you can fine-tune your gem implementation. For example, we can clear local C less frequently by moving the clearing step one loop outward. All these efforts led to a substantial performance improvement, reducing the time needed to process a 1k square matrices from 1900 milliseconds to just around 16 milliseconds. <laughs> That's an impressive improvement, I have to say. I wonder, uh, how does this thing scale for just like 4x4s, right? So like if you're doing game programming, does this all scale at that point? Or is N so small that it actually makes no real difference or even hurts it at a smaller level? Like, you know, because sometimes optimizations don't always... They don't always work uniformly. They work at certain sizes. Scales linearly, I think. I mean, does it? No real difference? I mean, because my, my real question is like, if it it may not matter at all on small amounts, right? I am wrong. <laughs> I It turns out I am actually wrong. No, I mean, I'm just curious. Four by four fit in cash. Okay. That is what she said. She, she did say that. A four by four always fits in cash. Especially considering there's no stuff like fancy GPU acceleration. The bad news is that you probably don't want to optimize GEM or any other linear algebra operations yourself. Because there's a much better option called basic linear algebra subprograms. The Intel MKL implementation of BLAS can get you only 2 milliseconds for a 1K resolution square matrix GEM. Plus, it also supports matrix multiplications between non-square matrices, unlike the crappy demo we showed today. But you get a point. That demo is MKL great. MKL is also off. using... First off, that demo was fantastic, okay? Great job on that demo. Second, 2 milliseconds? Vim, by the way, uh, what clearly clearly looks like uh, uh, lazy Vim, by the way. Lunar Vim, is this Lunar Vim? Okay, maybe. Similar approaches we use today somewhere in their proprietary code base. You said you want to know what makes it even eight times faster than the best we could do? Well, I did learn something doing that high throughput optimization course I took last semester, including separating the block hotspot into another module and using assembly intrinsics to mm. optimize it like crazy. And my professor also mentioned that even loading data into CMD registers in different orders can affect the performance. But I never use them in my own project, so I say I doubt if I can tell you anything about it. Anyway, if you enjoyed this video, remember to subscribe to the channel. As always, I hope you cash well, and see you in the next one. I hope you cash well. What a great, give that thumbs up. Give that subscribe, depth buff buffer. That was a great video. That was really, really, really well done. I think the thing that makes it so good is that everything he stated was extremely difficult, right? Everything. How many people are you subscribed to? Too many. But everything he talked about was like, it's a really difficult topic. And he did really good. That was surprising. I'm actually surprised at how much better he did that. And also, I think the second thing is that you see this all the time, which is people make it like, I think it's very easy for anybody to see the matrix multiplication algorithm and just be like, well, I mean, like, can you really make it that much faster? Like, even if we spend months optimizing it, can we really make it that much faster? And that thing went from like two seconds or yeah, two seconds to two milliseconds. Like that library made it a thousand times faster. And so I think sometimes you can make things quite a bit faster by playing around 
and having, uh, you know, not everything can be optimized that way. Obviously, if you're working with a web server, you really got to, you know, it's not going to be the same situation. You're not talking about a specific algorithm in which you're like looking at the assembly instructions. Instead, it's like, how are you managing memory? Uh, are you creating a lot of garbage? How often are you in garbage collection? How often are you returning back to the runtime? What's going on? Like, how much time can you spend just within just doing your code and doing the things you need to do and then getting out? You know, there's definitely a whole slew of things that can be very important. Yeah, the animations were very, very good. How often in JS? No, this is actually a really good one. You may not realize how important this one is. There are libraries that are written in native code that can be used often in JavaScript. And if you know them and you're doing a large chunk of your work in these native libraries, it can be really, really effective to replace them and not use JavaScript at all. And that's most specifically true in Node. In Bun, it's less. It's It seems to be less of an issue. You don't get nearly the same wins because Bun just has a really good optimization from JavaScript to the runtime. And so a lot of those wins go down. So spending more time in native doesn't, it, it's not like a 10x increase, right? You're getting like a two to three X increase. Uh, Bun just have a good JIT compiler. It's literally this. I mean, it's, it's, it's JSC versus V8. I think V8, if I'm not mistaken, is better than Bun. So to say that Bun has something that's much better, I don't know if that's true, right? I can't tell you if that's true or false because I don't know enough about JSC versus V8. Uh, anyways, the name. This is the primogen. I'm not going to do the cashogen, okay? We're not doing it. 